you. Hello, everybody. So as the last talk in this track, not of the whole conference, but the wonderful networking track, <laughs> I'm going to give you a little bit of a use case story. My name is Alexandra Winter. I'm the maintainer now of the device driver, the network device drivers of the IBM mainframe, Linux on the IBM mainframe. Uh, correctly said, IBM Z Systems. That's the official name right now at the moment. Also known as mainframe in the Linux kernel, it's always S390 for historical reasons. So a while ago, 20 years ago, Linux entered the mainframe. At that time, it was known as S390. So that's why everywhere in the Linux kernel, the references are to S390. That's the IBM mainframe. OK, one thing that is special about IBM Z systems, or IBM Z for short, is that by default, it's partitioned into multiple logical partitions, LPARs as we call them. So there's a hypervisor in hardware firmware implemented, hypervisor in firmware, which has a lot of hardware support in it. Uh, so there's always multiple operating systems running on the mainframe. And that can be Linux, basically any kind of Linux built for the mainframe, but all the distros, Red Hat, SUSE, Ubuntu, uh, they have versions for the mainframe. But it can be also be other operating systems. COS is the most common one that is built, that is running only on the mainframe. Inside for the Linux, it's just a system it's running on. And of course, it has to have network interfaces. So we have network cards in the mainframe. They are either dedicated to one system or typically um, virtualized by the hypervisor in the hardware. Uh, but from inside such a Linux system, it just sees a NIC. It's a network card that it operates on. It has, of course, a driver, uh, either a specific one, if it's our own, or a generic one. But it should looks like network interface in any other Linux. One special kind of network that we have inside uh, IBM Z is called HyperSockets that has no external interface. It's implemented in firmware with hyper support. Uh, of course, then it only works inside one machine. It's implemented doing direct memory moves. So from one output buffer of one system directly into the input buffer of the other system. Therefore, it has high throughput and low latencies, and people like it a lot. The thing is, however, it's an additional network interface and exists only inside one machine. But like the latest machines, by the way, have 80, up to 86 logical partitions. So these machines are really big. So it's worth having a network segment only inside that. But it comes with additional configuration. So you have to set up these additional interfaces. You have to set up typically an additional subnet. Um, and you have to set up routing rules. So you have to know which other servers are reachable via HyperSockets because they are in the same CAC. If you deploy an instance somewhere else, the routing rules no longer apply. So that makes a little bit of a hurdle for the operators. So what a typical user wants is a system with a single IP address that you can deploy everywhere automatically in your data center. And you have a flat layer two structure, and it just works. And HyperSockets doesn't play well with that concept at the moment. So the logical consequence would be, well, then use a bridge. And you can do that. So you can, for example, deploy a Linux bridge in one of the Linux instances and connect such a HyperSocket segment with the external network. And then you have a flat layer two network that can be represented as a single IP subnet. Every one of your servers here has a single IP address. Problem solved, right? No, user is still not totally happy because this can be a performance bottleneck. You have to decide how much computing power do you give it. That depends how many traffic needs to flow through this bridge. You always have an extra hop if you go outside. So that adds to the latency if you go to another system. And this bridge is a single point of failure. So you have to set up a backup bridge, have to set up a failover mechanism. All that is possible, but no, they want something more simple to handle. So what people have been asking of us is, can't you provide something that just gives me a single interface and the rest should happen automatically? So if 
this alpha A wants to talk to B, it should flow via hypersockets. If it wants to talk to D, it should flow via the external network or to the router or whatever. And here, if D wants to talk to E, it should flow via this hypersockets. So hide it, all this complexity for me. I want to see a single network interface, a single IP address. On layer three, it should be just a single interface. And by the way, um, it should also support virtualization, please. So if in Linux you have containers or KVM guests or something that has their own interfaces and MAC addresses connected to this hypersockets converged interface, as we call this idea, uh, via MAC VTAP, open vSwitch, via a bridge, that means multiple MAC addresses are reachable via this interface, that should please work. And of course, things like containers, they come and go dynamically and they move from one instance to the other. And that should all please be detected automatically. So this is what we want to provide. Any comments or functions, what we want to do, why we want to do it. Otherwise, I proceed to the how did we do it. So building such a thing, you need to consider that uh, you don't create loops. That's the first thing that comes to mind when you see such a picture. And STP is not an option here because we want active interfaces into two different segments. So you need to turn off STP. That will do the opposite of what we want here. And we need some FDBs, forwarding databases, uh, inside every one of these HCI instances so that they know and can make this decision, send it via hypersockets or send it via the external network. And we want these FDBs to be opt updated automatically, so, so some kind of learning needs to be involved here. Uh, when you do learning, you get into a chicken egg problem because here's also an FDB, of course, inside this hypersockets firmware channel because it needs to know which message needs to go where, so which MAC addresses are in which endpoint. And it can only do the detection of learning if something is sent. So if you, uh, like this instance 1A and 2A, they could communicate happily via the external network and never realize that they could use hypersockets. So one option would be, well, always do the copy the gratuitous ARPs or any ARP messages via both, and you'll find out. But sometimes ARP takes a while until it takes place, if you think about live migration of guests. So maybe have something that can learn on any kind of message, things like that. The things that work for us is that, as I said, the HyperSockets firmware has its own FDB. And because it is firmware, any endpoint can query what MAC addresses do you think are reachable? With What would you forward? So it can clear the FDB, the current state. And the firmware can generate events on any interface that subscribes to it when something changes. So that is something where you should be able to work with. What options did we consider? Um, the first thing was, of course, well, if you have this intelligent firmware, why don't you do it in firmware and in the hardware of the system and don't bother the operating systems with it, especially if you have multiple different operating systems and every operating system would have to implement it. Um, that we ran into issues with that idea because the NICs are optimized to access the buffers in the operating system. And we really found that we need two different NICs to be represented because Otherwise, you copy it to one NIC, and then that one decides, no, it's not for me. It's for the firmware implemented. You have to send it over. You have an extra hop, which is what we wanted to avoid in the first place. Or um, it's really that we, we couldn't find, or you have to re-implement the whole device driver inside the NICs, which is also something that is not worth it. So we really found, no, it has, unfortunately, it has to be done in the operating systems, where the queues are, where the queuing disciplines are, where we go out. So then uh, we did some prototyping with the usual suspects. We did BPF prototype. We had it running. We also had an EB tables prototype, open flow prototype. Uh, got all that to run, because they are very nice in traffic steering. 
However, uh, this FDB thing, keeping the database up to date, we always found that you have to re-implement that in user space, uh, do the aging, do the learning somehow. And the bridge prototype, as opposed to that, gave us all that. It has an FDB already, uh, and it can do aging and learning for us. So therefore, that was the most promising one. And we went with that. So, somewhere I have a clock. If there's no questions at the moment, I will go well, how we did this implementation using the bridge and switch that. Yes? I was just curious. Um, you said you moved, you tried BPF and you ended up having to implement um, the forwarding database in the user space. Was there specific things missing for BPF that if you had them, you could have potentially done that in, in BPF instead? Yeah, a whole FDB, including aging and learning and parameters that we just need to tune. You will see here with the bridge that we really didn't have to touch the bridge code at all. Everything was there already. So it definitely could have been done with BPF, yes. But why bother if we can do it more easily? Yeah. So nothing that was really a road blocker. A wigger on the bridge? That is the normal Linux bridge Where? No, the in the kernel. Um, in every, well, yeah, that's it here. So um, this HSCI, HyperSockets Converged Interface, that we want to have in every LPAR is basically this picture here, the big black box that is zoomed into one HSCI. So every Linux has its own bridge inside its HSCI interface. Interface, quotes and quotes. So, how is that transparent for the user? Um, when using it, because here is one network interface that is defined as a bridge port. So, this big black box is a Linux bridge. It has three ports defined. One is the external interface, the other one is the hypersockets interface, and the third one is the HSCI interface. So the user still sees the whole topology, but he only yes. needs one. Yes, he only needs to deal with the HSCI. He sees the whole. Yes, if you do an IP list, uh, IP address show, then you see the whole topology, but you only need to deal with the HSCI. You need to give that one an IP address, you attach that one to your Open vSwitch or to your Mac VTAP, whatever. You need to handle only the HSCI, and the HSCI is a network interface for Opera. Microsoft did something similar with their network VC, I believe. More of a spread over I'm sure, I'm not familiar with that yeah. one, and can tell me later, uh, that'd be interested. But of course, I mean, Open Research itself is a kind of similar concept, so there's other people that have been doing things like that for their purposes, yeah. So the behavior that we want to achieve here is no loops. So yes, turn SCP off is one thing that we need to do, as I explained earlier, and then, um, yeah, no, let me show you this picture more. The arrows are important. So in these pictures, the arrows uh, represent a data flow. The red arrows is the default data flow that we want. So if anything goes from inside the system, inside the HSC interface, the default should be it flows out to the external interface. And only if it's found in the blue database, it should be sent via the HyperSockets interface. If something comes in, either via hypersockets or external, it should be sent to the HSC interface. And no forwarding between external interface and hypersockets interface. You can achieve that with the bridge isolation feature using isolated bridge ports. So we set the hypersockets interface and the external interface to isolate it on. This is depicted here by the black line between them. And HSCI is isolated off. So then we have the data flow with these arrows. Um, the default, as I said, from HSCI, uh, something that comes into via HSCI should be the external interface. To achieve that, we set the external to flooding on, and HSCI also to flooding on, but hypersockets to flooding off. Then we will have the effect that hypersockets is only used if it's explicitly listed in the database. And 
the thing that we should learn about guest entries and additional max showing up. We just set HSCI to learning on. The other two can be set to learning off. The external, because it's the default anyhow, you don't need to learn about the whole big data center world that's outside there. And HyperSocket speed because we want to learn from the firmware and not by analyzing uh, the MAC headers. And by the way, of course, we don't expect a user to do these settings. We have a little user space tool that will do all that for the user. This is for you to tell you the details, how it's implemented inside. It's not, and by the way, but also if a user would show the bridge settings, he would see it. Yes, it's not hidden, but he doesn't have to deal with it. He will have a little uh, tool that where you say HSI, uh, HSCI add, name the two interfaces, and then everything is done for him. Attach what? Excuse me, I didn't get the. Could you attach perhaps? <laughs> Actually, that's what I did here. This is a VHH pair. Ah, yeah. I see. Okay. So then maybe you can have like the number namespace directly on the HCI bridge. Yeah. You could do that, yeah. At the moment, there uh, is no namespace uh, support implemented, but yes. That's... Maybe if uh, there's use cases for it, it would be easy to add that, yeah. So. If it is listed in the bridges database, so you manually add, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> very good question. Leads me to the next slide. Um, so this works wonderful if the database is correct and updated, then everything flows. But how do we get this database populated? What is reachable via hypersockets? We want to learn it from the firmware. And for that, we use the switch dev device driver model. Uh, I guess most of you are familiar with that, but let me do, spend one minute <laughs> to explain it. Um, so the switch dev device driver model was invented to, for the case that Linux runs on a hardware switch, a real hardware switch with many ports. And then each switch port is represented by a network interface. This picture here is from documentation in, in the Linux kernel. And many functions are implemented in the hardware, but are represented in the kernel uh, with the interfaces that are represented in the kernel. So that you can use the user space tools that you would use for a software bridge, for example, to manipulate your hardware switch. So a very typical use case would be that you do define a bridge here inside the kernel that represents your hardware switch. And as you can see, this is not exactly what we want to do with HSCI, but there are functions in this uh, device driver model that are useful for us. For especially, there are notifiers to keep the FDB database of the hardware switch in sync with the FDB of this Linux bridge. There's notification mechanisms. And that is something that is really useful for us. So now these arrows here, oh, I think that was on the other page. Yeah, so I, here I list them there. So there's much more to the switch dev device driver model. But the thing we are interested in are these two pairs of notifiers over there. One going uh, from the hardware to the software bridge, FDB add to bridge that the hardware can inform uh, about a new rule or delete. And the other ones for the other direction. So if, for example, a user would use the user space tool to manually define a rule, then the software bridge would propagate that down to the hardware FDB using these notifiers here, add to device or delete to device. And now we're using those in our HSCI to update the FDBs. So these red arrows here are these notifiers, delete from device, add to device, add to bridge, delete from bridge. 
And I guess it's most easy to understand if we play this little example. So say, for example, we have virtualization here. We have these two partitions using HSCI. Guess 2 is added to the picture, has its own MAC address, and it starts sending out something, neighbor discovery uh, signals, whatever it sends out first, will be learned by the HSCI interface of the left bridge automatically and will be added to the uh, FDB of the left bridge. And the FDB will then send out a notification to the subscribed uh, entities, uh, bridge to device, there's a new rule. So then the HyperSockets device driver is subscribed, can add it to the firmware database. Firmware knows this new MAC address can be found here. Anything will be sent there. And at the same time, firmware can send out a notification device to bridge to update the right uh, bridge and any other HSC in interface that is on this channel uh, to add this rule to this FDB that this MAC address is reachable via this HyperSockets channel. Then everybody's happy. Yeah, so every HyperSockets interface subscribes for such an event. So if there's many, and you can even have more than 86 because you could have hyper software hypervisors there that have multiple interfaces or so. So you can have hundreds of interfaces on one such HyperSockets channel, and every one that is subscribed will get such an event. No, there's just this one uh, FDB in the, bridge. in the bridge, but the driver forwards this notification. The model is a little bit confusing. Do you have two bridges controlling one hardware FDB? Uh, no, that is the thing. Forget about the, uh, I think in, the, in your mind you have the switch dev model, yeah. where these uh, all these FDBs are the same. They are not. They are different FDBs with different content. They are just notifying each other about updates that are relevant. Like multiple uh, switches inside the hardware? There is just one FDB in this HyperSockets channel. And then there's one FDB per HSCI. What happens if I register the same map and then two boxes? Well, uh, you shouldn't do that in any way, even without, with and without HSCI. So that it's separate VMs. How, how would you know? So actually, what would happen? Yeah, but then, first of all, short answer: it will not work as sure. anyhow always if you use two MAC addresses in two different instances. So uh, what would actually happen? The second one loses. So you cannot register uh, the same MAC address twice. So, but that is, it would not work. You would get into trouble. Yeah, inside each box it would work perfectly because these are separate boxes, separate bridges. Yes. You connect them to a hardware. Yes. Yeah. So the model is a little bit, a little bit. Uh, yeah, but you would get in trouble without hypersockets even if you connect them via the external network. Uh, to each other, yeah, but it's the max. Yeah, so the idea is you want to connect them. That's yeah. why you have an external yeah. interface. Yeah. If you want isolated islands of network segments, then don't do yeah, that. This is where it's right. Yeah, yeah. Two bridges, confirm one is the hardware. So kind of you have the connection to the external network already, but you want to use the performance benefits of hypersockets if they're next to each other. That is the use case. So one more thing is actually missing because um, for hypersockets we need to pre preserve um, the behavior for compatibility. So we cannot just add this behavior to any hypersockets interface because um, if somebody has already hypersockets running, he doesn't want to suddenly get all these notifications. And it could also be that HyperSockets is attached to a bridge, but you don't want these updates and notifications flowing back and forth in a normal bridge scenario. You only want it for this HSCI scenario. 
So we need to some kind of switch to turn that on and off. And in Lisbon, actually, at the LPC, uh, Rupa Prado and Dave Erhorn uh, gave me the hint to use this attribute, Bridgeport attribute, that is documented, le called Learning Sync, and documented as enables um, learning entries to bridge FTB. Sounds good. It is was already supported by IP route, so the tooling was there already. Uh, and man page of IP says controls whether it will sync MAC addresses. Sounds exactly like what we're doing, so let's use it. The funny thing was uh, it was not used anywhere in the kernel. Uh, it was never set. So the switch dev drivers, they reported this always on. Uh, so you can read it, but you cannot set it. And there was no interface, no nick anywhere that was using this to control anything. But we thought, well, let's revive it, is exactly what we want. And we added the support to the HyperSockets driver. Ah, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'm on my almost last slide. So, summary, we implemented the desired thing, merge an external network with a preferred network segment where you can only reach a subset of the targets using existing bridge and switch dev behavior. And actually, all we had to add uh, were support to the HyperSockets device driver to forward these notifications back and forth. And actually, one little patch to the bridge code, but that is a more generic one, add a notification to flush all the learned entries that was just available in one direction, but not in the other direction. And actually, in the meantime, that is used by the DSA um, switch also. So that is not really something special for HSCI. So uh, I guess I gave this talk to give you an impression what that sometimes you can do unexpected things with things like switch dev and the bridge. Um, that without much effort, we were able to achieve what we wanted. So as lunch is ready, I thank you for your interest and your attention. <laughs>